TD, was appointed as Minister of State for European Affairs in June 2017 and has served as a Fine Gael TD for the Meath East constituency since March 2013. She was previously appointed Minister of State for Mental Health and Older People in May 2016. So please give a welcome to Minister Macken. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Firstly, just to say a, a massive thank you to Barry and, of course, to all of the team here at the Institute for organising what is a very timely intervention, um, an invitation to join my Swedish colleague, Anne Lind, to discuss our prospective perspectives, I think, um, on the future of Europe. And just to say thank you to Anne for being here, but also for um, your contribution today on this ongoing debate and, and for sharing with us where things are going. The Institute for International and European Affairs has always been a catalyst for new thinking and it will bring together the best from the private and the public sector to work with us on new solutions and on new policy options for Europe's future. I think sometimes when you want to anticipate the future you have to firstly understand the past. It's easier to plot a course for the future when you have a fix on what's actually driving the present. What are the policies and the arrangements that have brought us this far? How did we get to where we are today? And so these are the questions which help us work out the next steps, which help us get a better grip on what might work and, of course, what won't work. Earlier this year, the EU27 celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, so the 1957 treaty which founded the European Economic Community. It is the founding document that we call today the European Union. Back then it was designed to serve the purposes of six founding nations, but several revisions later it still serves as an inspiration for today's much broader membership and it can still guide us in the charting a course for EU27. Most historians, I think, would cast the treaty and the European project as a great coming together after the ravages of the Second World War and as a novel but unprecedented move to bring forward peace and security to the continent, and this is true. But it is also a response to the economic exhaustion prevailing after the war. It was also a response to international trade, which had gone into hibernation, and although fascism was well and truly discredited, politics was very much up for grabs, with more than a few countries ready to experiment with other isms, including communism. Just one year earlier, two European powers, France and the UK, discovered the very hard way during the Suez Canal crisis that they no longer had the clout they thought they had and that their hands were tied by Washington. At the same time, Europe was facing a new threat from the Soviet Union, and it's hard to imagine today that it was actually of two minds, do we face this threat with Germany or without Germany? In the meantime, the UK was trying to make up its own mind about Europe, should we join it, should we not? During the treaty negotiations, the former Foreign Secretary, Herbert Morrison, famously said joining the common market would be the end of a thousand years of history, so it didn't join. We know then, obviously, it later did. In short, the 1957 Europe was struggling to meet the needs of its citizens. It had no real voice on the international stage, and to put it mildly, it was confused as to what direction it should take. What is striking, therefore, is just how prosaic the language of the actual treaty was, given the challenges. What we might have expected was a text that was much more rhetorical. Instead, what jumps off the page is pragmatism. It talks about the improvement of living and working conditions, about eliminating barriers, about balanced trade and fair competition. It talks about progressive ab abolition of restrictions on international trade, reducing differences with less favoured regions, pooling resources to strengthen peace, and of course, an ever closer union among the people. The treaty also included a call to other peoples of Europe to join their efforts. And since then, Ireland and Sweden and many un others have answered that call, and more again are currently engaged in the accession process. 60 years on, we are once again looking for the clarity that led Europe so successfully out of the confusion back then that reigned within its borders around its neighbourhood and, of course, throughout the globe. Most discussions on the future begin by emphasising how complicated and how turbulent the world has become. We talk about multiple challenges, the financial crisis, the migration crisis, climate change, Brexit, the emergence of new powers, the decline of others, and a general sense that the voters have less and less confidence in the people that they have actually elected. And it would, of course, be wrong to ignore these um, underestimate or to ignore or underestimate any of these challenges, but I think it would also be wrong to let them overwhelm us. When the leaders of EU27 met in Rome in March, they came close to capturing the approach we need to take in the future of Europe debate when they said we want a union that is safe, that is secure, prosperous, competitive, sustainable and socially responsible, and the will and the capacity of playing a key role in the world and shaping globalisation and amongst all of the challenges we face and the things we have a cross-border element to them. 
Anne has set out, I suppose, a number of Sweden's wants um, and where they are going. And Sweden, I think, similar to us, wants the EU to focus on job creation, particularly among our young people. We in Ireland have the second youngest population in Europe, so it is a key priority. Sweden wants a digital single market that helps its SMEs do business digitally and helps consumers avail of services online. So do we, and indeed we spent much time um, over lunch and, and in our own meeting discussing this, and I think we agree that any barrier to doing business online or digitally or cross borders, it's a barrier to trade, it's a barrier to progress, and again we agree, I think, a barrier to jobs. Both countries want ambitious trade agreements that respect the high standards that our citizens expect, agreements that provide better opportunities for jobs and growth. And likewise, Sweden and Ireland are very strong advocates for strong environmental policies and greater solidarity among member states when it comes to migration. In short, I think both of, both of us recognise the fundamental importance of the European Union in dealing with issues that affect us. In Ireland, we have undertaken extensive analysis of the consequences of Brexit, and our unequivocal conclusion is that our future interests are best served by remaining a fully committed member of the European Union, notwithstanding the UK's departure, of course. Like Sweden, we see it as the best instrument we have for addressing the new challenges we are facing, serving the needs of our citizens who want to live, study, work, move and prosper freely across the continent. In the early 1900s, Europe accounted for 25% of the world's population. By 2060, it will represent less than 5%. Long-term trends would suggest that Europe's share of the world's GDP will fall from around 22% to much less than 20% by 2030. And thanks to longer life expectancies, and this is something I learned in my previous role, Minister for Older People, the average age in Europe will be 45, um, making us the oldest continent in the world. So by contrast, the average age in Africa would be just over 21 years in 2030, so that shows you where we're heading. So I would ask the question, would we be better dealing with this brave new world on our own or together with our partners in a major economic power with unparalleled levels of social protection and welfare? When we try to find new markets for exports, will it be easier to gain access on our own or with the weight of one of the world's biggest trading blocks behind us? In a world of asymmetric threats of international terrorism, do we go it alone or do we stand in solidarity with our partners sharing intelligence and putting in place protective mechanisms? If you ask me, and I, and I assume if I ask most people here, I would argue that we would be much better together. Together with Sweden, we will work with our friends and our allies in Europe, crafting a common agenda that meets the needs of our citizens. And I think it's timely, therefore, to have a full debate on the type of Europe that we want to have, that we want to see, but most importantly, that we want to be part of. Of course, we also want the future of Europe debate to be fair and to be honest. And I think an honest debate should be one that confronts the myths about Europe. And a debate that is citizen-focused will be more about outcomes than institutions. An honest debate will also be one that recognises that the European Union is not perfect. The leaders of the EU27 acknowledged that last year when they were in Bratislava, when they launched the debate, and it might be a statement of the obvious, but if the EU was perfect, it would not be in need for renewal. And the reality is that it does indeed need renewal. What we don't need in any debate is rhetoric. We should take the same level-headed and dispassionate approach that the architects of the Treaty of Rome took and to look at pragmatic solutions in this area. In my opinion, we need to ask how the EU27 can deliver on these three promises, prosperity and stability, freedom and values, and finally, peace and security. I'm already engaged with organisations such as the Institute here with European Affairs and European Movement Ireland, and together with Minister Simon Coveney, I will be leading a process of public engagement and debate across the country in the very near future. I know that the Institute is working on responses to the Commission's white papers and the five reflection papers, and we obviously report, or we, we await your response with interest. I think um, the five reflection papers, they're not inclusive, they're not exhaustive, but they obviously give us a platform to start and, and to further the discussion that we're having. Others, such as the President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, and of course the President of France, Emmanuel Macron, are busy making proposals, and we know we've heard uh, some of those proposals in recent days, and while not all of them we would agree with, it is important that we in Ireland get ahead of the debate, that we make our own contribution, and that our contribution very much reflects the concerns and the expectations of the Irish people. All too often, I think, and we've seen this previously in, in referendums and debates that we've had, when we engage on Europe, we get torn between Eurofanatics and Eurosceptics. The Eurofanatics 
sometimes leave us feeling that it is a, a union and a club that knows best, but it's often too complicated for me or you or others to understand. And the Eurosceptics, they demonise us and they frog the debate. And we saw in the Brexit referendum in the UK where we're, we had lies, we had straight bananas, and we had a lot of fake news as well. So I think this is a process that has a lot of dimensions. It will depend on the wise counselling of organisations such as the Institute here and many others. And it will depend enormously on the quality of our engagement with the wider public. The European Union still enjoys immense popular support in Ireland. I think the recent um, questionnaire showed us at 86% in favour of the European Union, but I don't think we should be naive and take this support for granted. Notwithstanding the support the Union commands, we should expect a very robust debate in Ireland. This is why we need a calm and considered and inclusive debate. And to, to quote and to finish on this, Jean-Claude Juncker, the future of Europe cannot be decided by decree. It has to be the result of democratic debate and ultimately broad consensus. So I would ask you all to join in that debate. Thank you.